further ado, I'd like to introduce Kristen Stapleton, the president for, of the APDA of Massachusetts. Hi, Bill. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is the Massachusetts chapter annual meeting, and it is a board meeting. So um, there are some formalities we'll go through. Uh, for example, I will call to order this 2020 Massachusetts chapter annual meeting. Uh, also, at this time, we would um, like to uh, motion to accept the previous meeting's minutes. So I will motion to do that. If one of my board members uh, on the call could just second that motion, uh, we could um, enter those minutes and uh, move on to a, a full agenda. I second Thank that motion. Thank, thank you. Okay, as Bill said, a um, couple of things. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, make sure you are on mute unless you are speaking. And as Bill said as well, we are monitoring the chat box, so please do that. Uh, but we will ask that you hold questions to the end. When we are done, there will be an opportunity for anybody and everybody that wants to participate and answer questions to do so. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, 2020 has been a challenging year, not only for us, but I'm sure many of you. And uh, a world of which we've gone virtual, as you are a testament to today. Uh, but we are proud of what we've been able to do over this uh, last few months in offering uh, quality services and programs to the people that we serve in the Parkinson's community and their care partners. You know, our mission here is to provide support, education, and resources uh, to everyone impacted with Parkinson's. Um, and we estimate in Massachusetts there's a population of about 17,000 people living with Parkinson's and that doesn't include their care partners and their families. So that's a fairly significant population. And uh, we estimate that we, we single-handedly, if you will, as a community serve at somewhere between seven to 10,000 um, of those people. And uh, we're proud to do that. And the purpose of this meeting is to review some of our successes of 2020 and share them with you to overview what our, our future and our vision is for 2021. Uh, and it's also a time for elections to elect um, new board members and then to reelect those on the board that are continuing, um, continuing to volunteer with us. Uh, and we will get an introduction as we go through the meeting to the board, uh, but with, um, I would like to welcome our president and CEO from the National uh, APDA, Leslie Chambers, who's going to uh, offer us a few words from, from her national chair position. Great, hey, thank you, Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yes, can. Wonderful. Uh, and thank you, Bill, and thank you everyone for inviting me. It's, it's thrilling to be uh, connected in any shape or form um, throughout the organization and, and my role and capacity. And one of the uh, outcomes of COVID and virtual life, I think, is a greater connectivity, uh, not only between uh, the partnership between the national and home office and national board of directors, as well as uh, the chapters, information referral centers and advanced centers. But I'm also seeing these amazing connections being made between the chapters. And um, we have, and we always will look to Massachusetts as one of our strongest chapters uh, filled, chalk filled with leaders, both from uh, the staff positions, from volunteer positions, um, from your advisors, you guys really lead the pack. So um, give yourself a, a, a pat on the back right now because you really are highly esteemed um, in the organization. And uh, so that is really wonderful. So it's great to be here. Um, I wanted to kind of give you the, just the lay of the land where we are as an organization um, in total. As Chris said, and as we all know, it's been an extraordinary year. Uh, but I am extremely proud of what we've been able to accomplish, again, not only in Massachusetts, but across the country. Um, when you, if you were to have asked me back in April or May uh, what the future looked like for us, I was really concerned and really worried. Um, you know, to switch over, first of all, of our programs and services into the virtual community, um, as well as our fundraising, it was really uncharted territory for all of us. And um, it has been an, an amazing year. We have had one of the best years financially 
um, in aggregate as an organization. Uh, but the numbers, as Chris pointed out, just in Massachusetts, but a, a throughout the entire country, the numbers of people that we have been serving is just skyrocketing. Um, but even more importantly, the way that we are connected to the Parkinson's community has been tremendous. Um, there are a lot of folks that are shut in through quarantining, um, a variety of reasons, but we have in some cases been the lifeline uh, to folks in the community, whether it's through support groups, educational programs, uh, health and wellness activities. Uh, we have uh, singing programs. I know you have this amazing singing program in Massachusetts. We also have a couple other ones, um, but I love to participate in those programs because the connections that APDA is making, um, first of all, has been based on the great connections and strong collaborations you have built for years and years and years in the community. So it was a natural when we went virtually um, that those strong connections really helped lay the foundation for um, increasing the number of people that we reached and the number of programs and services. So it, it's kind of the silver lining uh, for us. We've had a lot of learnings. We are going to continue virtual programming even post COVID, I think we have seen that we have such a greater reach uh, in some cases that we will continue. So um, I am really excited about the future. Uh, speaking about the future, we are getting ready to launch the planning process for our next strategic plan, which will be fiscal years 22 through 24. And I wanted you all to give a round of applause to your fearless uh, executive director, Bill Pat Jane, because he is taking on a huge leadership role in the planning process uh, for the entire organization's strategic plan. We have divided the strategic plan. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. We have uh, divided the planning process around mission into two subcommittees. One will examine our programs and services going forward, and the other will look at our research portfolio and our strategies and research. And um, Bill will be co-chairing uh, with uh, one of the national colleagues, Rosa Pena, in the programs and services area. And so you will be hearing from Bill um, in that capacity. One of the uh, critical strategies in a strategic plan, I feel for an organization, is that it's built from the top down and the bottom up which means that all of you will have a voice in that strategic planning. So throughout the next several months, we will convene a variety of meetings. Uh, we will have town hall meetings. We will also tap into educational programming that we're doing and survey participants. So you will all have an opportunity to weigh in in the strategic plan. Uh, that's what makes it a vibrant uh, plan, not something that sits on the shelf. So stay tuned and thanks again, Bill, for uh, volunteering <laughs> to be in that capacity. We really appreciate it. Um, so you'll be hearing more about the National Strategic Plan. I mentioned, uh, again, financially, we're in great shape as a national organization. If you have not done so, uh, please visit the national website. Um, under the financial and reports, you can take a look. Our last year's uh, annual report has been posted um, along with all the milestones and all the achievements uh, that we have done collectively as an organization. So please check that out. Um, Going back to the strategic plan, the three questions that we are going to examine are the following. One, what does the Parkinson's community, people with Parkinson's and their care partners and families need and want? Two, how are we going to deliver those programs at APDA, both nationally and individually in communities? And three, how do we increase our reach into underserved populations and diversify our programs and services and the people that we reach? Uh, we've conducted a lot of research over the last couple of years uh, through our insight survey. We have also launched and um, executed two um, focus group processes, both in the African-American and Spanish speaking communities. We've, we've learned a great deal about how we reach those communities and the types of programs we need to provide. And three, some of you may know that we uh, launched and had in 2019, the first ever diversity conference, where we looked at 
one, um, how do we reach out to uh, young researchers in, in um, communities that are more diverse? How do we capture them early on in their, uh, their research careers and get them involved in studying Parkinson's? And two, how do we increase the enrollments in clinical trials of diverse communities? These are huge problems, not just in the field of Parkinson's, but across the board. So the data that we have gotten um, from both that conference and from the focus groups, we will help shape the things that we do, both in terms of research and programs and services in our strategic plan. So stay tuned. Um, again, I just wanted to thank our wonderful partnership that we've had with the Massachusetts chapter. Um, you are always there to support whatever it is that we're doing. If we're uh, piloting a new program or a service throughout the country, you have stepped up. Uh, you have always provided ex um, exceptional um, advisory uh, consultation to us. Our relationship with Boston University is surpassed by none um, at the rehab center. So all of these collaborations that we have in Massachusetts, I wanted to thank you again, and we would like to replicate those across the country in many places. So thank you for all of that. Um, so I think I'll close for, for now. And uh, I think we'll take questions at the end, Chris. Um, yeah. But if there are any things that uh, show up on the chat, I'd be happy to answer those as well. So thank you very much and have a great meeting. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Uh, well, next up is one of my favorite things. Uh, it is called the Sean Thornton Award. And each year we solicit nominations for um, a person that exemplifies service excellence and continued uh, support to people living with Parkinson's. Some number of years ago, we uh, were approached by Sean Thornton, who at the time was playing for the Bruins and developed a great friendship. Uh, Parkinson's is very close um, to his heart and he um, has done tremendous things to help um, not only the Massachusetts chapter, but um, people living with Parkinson's. Um, and we continue that relationship with him, even um, though he has come, um, moved on to Florida um, with the Florida Panthers. So this year's recipient, not only does her professional experience um, exemplify her commitment to those living with Parkinson's, but she has been uh, a volunteer for the board for, um, I'm not gonna give her age away, but probably half of her life. Uh, and she continues to serve. Um, she is secretary on the Mass Chapter Board, and she is a facilitator for one of our uh, many support groups. Uh, so this year's recipient, congratulations to Melissa Diggin. Oh, thank you guys so much. I actually have the award here. It's hard to see, but Sean Thornton Award for Excellence in Service to the Parkinson's Community with my name and the year etched on the back. So this is a very bright spot in 2020 for me. Um, it's such a pleasure working with the Parkinson's com uh, community. And yes, it has been actually half my life that I've uh, worked and volunteered with them. And I definitely want to say a thank you to Kathy Thomas and Denise Turpin and Marie St. Hilaire, who I worked with initially right out of college and got me involved in the Parkinson's community. And Chris, you as well, volunteering um, for all the APDA functions. Um, I mean, I think it says something to the community that, you know, people join and they just don't leave. We, um, the Parkinson's community is like my family. So, um, thank you to all of you who make this such a rewarding experience for me. Thank you, Melissa. Certainly a worthy um, award winner. So uh, everybody, yay to Melissa. <laughs> Look forward to many more years working with you, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So now we're going to move on to um, a little bit of a local family story. Joining us today are Carrie and Eileen Bogle, um, and they're gonna share a bit about um, their experience and their involvement with uh, Parkinson's and the APDA. So, Carrie? Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to share our thoughts about an experience about the Optimism Walk this year and uh, a recent program I participated in at UMass that will be near and dear to Lisa's heart. The Optimism Walk, I've always considered that to be a great name for the, uh, for the event because of the optimism that's, that's the underlying theme. Unfortunately, in 2020, uh, optimism seems to be in short supply. And uh, we, we really weren't surprised when the pandemic 
caused the uh, 2020 optimism walk to be canceled. That cancellation resulted in, uh, in our minds, both disappointment and determination. Disappointment in the fact that we're gonna miss the positive energy and optimism generated by the event. And also I was gonna miss the free pens and ice cream that you get. There was also determination on our part to raise money for the APDA without the benefit of the Optimism Walk event. So the question we were asking ourselves is how can we capture the attention of our potential donors and encourage them to give in, in such a challenging year for fundraising? And we had a moment of aha after thinking about this for a while. And we considered the similarities the, uh, op of the Optimism Walk with the iconic Boston Marathon. There's a lot of similarities between the two events. First of all, you join a lot of others in pursuing a common goal. In the Optimism Walk, it's walking three miles. In the uh, Boston Marathon, of course, it's running 26.22 miles. Beyond that, you, you do it at your own pace. You do the best you can. And however far you go is, is, is OK. So the answer to the question of how can we engage our potential donors was to combine elements of the Optimism Walk and the Boston Marathon and under undertake an Optimism Marathon Walk. That would be a challenging but doable goal. We were gonna walk 26.22 miles in the five weeks before the original Optimism Walk date. And we're going to raise $1,000 for APDA. Now it was, it was I say doable with a question mark because I'd never done a lot of walking before that. Eileen was the walker in the family. So I was gonna see what we, could, what we could do to accomplish that. So we announced the Optimism Marathon walk to our potential donors and uh, also let them know what the fundraising goal was. Then again, on April 26th, on most days, we put on our sneakers, applied sunscreen, grabbed our walking sticks, or at least I grabbed my walking sticks, and I also grabbed Eileen, and we walked in, in about a mile or so in the neighborhood. And uh, we only took a few days off. And the communication with our potential donors was uh, one more communication at the halfway point where we just gave them an update on our progress in the walking and, and uh, the, the fundraising, our progress towards the fundraising goal. And it took us, took us more than you know, the, the world-class two hours the marathon has run. It only took us 33 days, three hours and 27 minutes. But we, we did complete the Optimism Marathon walk. We announced the successful completion to our uh, donors and potential donors with a reminder that there was still time to donate. And when all was said and done, we raised $1,580 for APDA. So we were proud of that. Then the question is, I think donors often ask this question, what happens to the, to the money? So what happens to the $1,580 we raised? Well, when we, when we solicited the donations, we uh, emphasized that APDA was a, an excellent organization divert, deserving of, your, of our support and uh, assured, assured donors that their money would be used judiciously to provide quality programs for those living with Parkinson's. I recently participated in the Parkinson's Disease Communication Swallowing Wellness Group, which is a Zoom-based program delivered by Lisa Summers, graduate students from the Department of Communication Disorders at UMass Amherst and guest speakers. I found it to be uh, a representative of the practical high quality programs funded by APDA. There's a lot to be said about the class that focuses on the impact of PD on speech, communication, swallowing, and cognition with an emphasis on wellness and prevention. The program was scheduled and took place for two, two times a week for one and a half hours each week, each session over, five, over a five week period. Now given my somewhat limited attention span, the fact that I attended and actually looked forward to each of the classes speaks volumes for the program. The maximum class size is 10. We had 10 in, in my, my session. And this allows for a great deal of individual attention. And I'm one who loves individual attention. Just ask Eileen. <laughs> the, uh, each, of the, each of the participants was paired with two, uh, two grad students. 
And these, these trios would meet as separate in separate Zoom breakout rooms for a portion of each class to discuss the topic of the day's presentation, consider its relevancy to the participant and or do baseline assessments. All aspects of the program were well organized and well executed. In fact, they made it look easy. In my experience, if you can make a program like this look easy, in any case, they've done thorough planning and preparation. And uh, in terms of the individual attention theme, after the final class meeting, each of us received an individualized list of recommended actions and activities to promote our well being and make us more effective in dealing with our Parkinson's. These recommendations are based on observations by Lisa and the graduate students, as well as discussions in our breakout rooms. And Lisa, you'll be glad to know I do have a hearing loss as suspected. Uh, I did have the hearing test done, and uh, who knows? Eileen says I never listened to her anyway. <laughs> After the conclusion of the program, I felt compelled to send a, an email to Bill. And Eileen likes to point out to me that I don't often say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, here's the e text of the email. Hello, Bill. The last time we spoke, you may recall my mentioning that I was registered for the fall session of the PD Communication of Swallowing Wellness Program being offered by the UMass Amherst Department of Communication Disorders with the help of APDA funding. The program concluded last Friday and I'm pleased to report that it was excellent. The material presented by Elisa Summers, her graduate students and various guest speakers was well-organized, informative and germane. Even though the program was Zoom-based, Lisa and the students were able to establish a casual and caring milieu. The use of breakout rooms gave each participant individual attention and encouragement. Along with everybody else, I was sad to see the program end, but glad to have enjoyed such an excellent experience. Kudos to you and your APD staff, APD staff for supporting this outstanding program. Regards, Carrie. And also an opportunity now to say kudos to Lisa and her graduate students for the excellent job they did for us in that, in that program. So uh, without further ado, speaking of Lisa Summers, I'd like to introduce her. Just, well, would we do that? I just wanted to add that um, how impressed I have been with your ability to put programs, of, you know, make them available through Zoom. And um, a lot of organizations have tried to do it. And mm -hmm. in particular, yours have been much more seamless the quality of um, the programming has been excellent. You know, you've been bringing the capacity to bring in experts from different parts of the country has been wonderful. Um, so I, I just wanted to really give you so much credit for pulling it together so quickly that, that you know, I know if, if, having done some of this work before I retired, it's not easy. And it, it's not easy for organizations to pivot and, and, you know, this has been a tough time. Um, and Carrie has really used a lot of the programming that you fund. And, and I think that that just want to give you a lot of, of, of credit for that. So, okay. Thank you. So again, without further ado, I'm pleased to turn the, uh, turn the screen over to Lisa Summers. Lisa is the clinical director and clinical associate professor for the Center of Learning, Center for Language, Speech, and Hearing, the Department of Communication Disorders, University of Massachusetts Amherst. What a title. <laughs> yeah, I know. But thank you so much, Carrie. And it's so good to see you again, um, see your face over Zoom. I don't know what I'm going to do if I ever see you in person. I think probably give you a really big hug if that's possible. So <laughs> I'm really glad to be here um, and um, to see everyone here and, and welcome you to this meeting and um, talk a little bit about one of the the programs that the APDA um, does fund. So um, I'm coming to you from you um, from Western Massachusetts, where University of Massachusetts Amherst is. Although you know our geographic barriers are really have really been lifted in a lot of ways um, these days. Um, I've been at UMass since 2014. Uh, before coming here, I practiced as a speech language pathologist for almost 30 years. 
And um, I specialized in working with people with Parkinson's disease. And I'm really excited um, I, that I've been able to um, serve as an advisor to the Massachusetts chapter of the APDA um, in the areas of communication and swallowing, all things um, that speech language pathologists specialize in. And I really continue to be impressed with the community programs and resources um, that the APDA um, and specifically the Massachusetts chapter um, funds for people in this state. So um, next slide. So with that in mind, um, I came to the state after clinical practice and I was finding that there were definitely some um, some things when I was in clinical practice that, that were gaps that I had that I really wished that um, uh, uh, I could do something about for patients. Patients were often coming to me um, well along in the disease process and I was wishing that I had access to them earlier. And often when they would seek out my services, I would find that they um, really didn't have a good understanding of why I was recommending what I was recommending. Um, it took a little while to really educate them. And when I would work on educating the Parkinson's community by going to support groups and presenting, I felt like I reached some people, but it it was really hard to reach everyone effectively because it was a short period of time and there's a lot of information to cover and it's complicated. Um, and so I, I decided that when I had the opportunity to be at UMass and I had access to these amazing graduate students that I could um, use to help me, I um, decided that I was gonna develop this group. And this group really um, goes over um, a lot of evidence-based treatments and um, it is um, something that, you know, the research is, is always evolving and so it needs to be updated constantly. And um, I, I think that, you know, these sorts of things take some time for people to process and take in. And so having 10 sessions to establish a relationship, allow people to go away and think about what we present to them, be able to come back and ask more follow-up questions, um, have time to, to really have um, a reality check for how they're actually doing in some of these different areas that we talk about to help build some insight and some understanding. Um, it creates a really safe space. Um, you know, I think the participants in the group really develop close relationships with their with their grad students. And um, uh, I think that that really helps in the end for them to really understand and accept the recommendations that we're making. Um, so the, the other thing that makes this so great and makes it such a win-win situation is that the grad students learn so much too. So the participants who have Parkinson's disease and their, their family members and care partners really teach the grad students in a way that I can't teach them. And um, that a, a class in grad school is not going to teach. So um, that's why it's just such this win-win situation. Next slide. So the group is designed, like Carrie said, he already told you um, how often they meet and everyone gets their own grad student. Um, I've been running this group since I developed it um, in 2015 and it was in person and it was in Amherst. Um, and then of course, COVID happened and the group that I was thinking that I was gonna run in May and June didn't end up running. And I realized that there would be a way for me to, to to transform the group into a virtual format. So the, the format that I did in June and July um, was over Zoom. Um, and like Carrie said, we use breakout rooms um, to have both group and individual time. And people start out by getting screened on a variety of communication and swallowing areas to get kind of a reality check of where things stand with some of their, um, their, their different um, functional areas. And then the graduate students present on various topics having to do with communication and swallowing. Like, you know, here's how we produce voice, here's how we swallow. And of course, grad students are so great with technology and they create very interesting PowerPoints for the participants. And then I follow up and present on how Parkinson's disease impacts these various areas. And then I talk about um, evidence-based treatments. Next slide. 
And so these are the topics that you can see that we that we go over. And um, in some of these areas, uh, I also have guest speakers coming in. So uh, it, the, it's always really um, interesting to, to see my grad students get almost starstruck. I have Linda Tickle Dagnan come in and talk about facial expression and they've read all of her work. And so they're always so excited to have her be a speaker. And um, we have, of course, I have um, various faculty members um, that are my colleagues that present sometimes. And one of the areas that I think is really great that we talk about, as Carrie referenced, is, is hearing. And I find that that's really not an area that is addressed very often for people with PD. And it's a huge area of need. And we need to do better educating people about um, their hearing and about the importance of hearing, particularly even with cognition. And there's definitely a connection there. And so um, I always make sure that I include that um, in, our, in our educational sessions. Next slide. And then I take feedback every time and I learn and I modify the group every single time based on the feedback from both the grad students and the participants. And um, this last time when I had my virtual format in the summer, people kept saying, I really wish that we had more time to socialize. And that was one of the, one of the sources of feedback that we had. So I created a breakout room um, that started a half an hour before the official start time of the group so that people could arrive early and they could go into this breakout room and they could just socialize with each other and get to know each other. You know how it is, you talk about who's your neurologist, what meds are you on, what exercise groups do you go to? And um, that was a real source of support um, and a chance for them to socialize with each other. And um, it, was, it was very popular, I think. Um, and I think uh, most of the group members exchanged contact information and became friends and are continuing to support each other after the group. So that's been a real positive thing as well. And I have a short little video. I interviewed Carrie's two graduate students, um, Anna and, and Jen, and they're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what the group was like for them. These are my students, Anna and Jen, and they were part of the Parkinson's group with me uh, that just finished up recently. And they were Carrie's student clinicians. And I thought it would be nice for you to hear how um, they felt about participating in the group. So Anna, we're gonna start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what group was like for you? Yeah, so prior to joining the group, I didn't have any experience with Parkinson's disease. And this was such a great experience because it allowed me to learn from numerous clients who were all living through Parkinson's disease differently. What I found especially important was learning about voice issues and how having voice issues affects people in their daily life. It was really profound to hear Carrie say that it was liber liberating to do voice exercises. Awesome. How about you, Jen? Yes, this group was definitely so valuable to me we we're able to work with the clients directly and as a group come together and learn from each other. Um, the symptoms that each patient experience vary so significantly. And this actually allows us to learn how to support people at different stages of this disease, which is super beneficial for sure. Um, this group provides an opportunity to learn more than what's just taught in the textbooks at school. Um, over these past five weeks, we were really able to build a team full of knowledge and most definitely full of support with one another. Um, I'd have to say this is definitely one of the best um, learning experiences is I've had in grad school thus far. Awesome. Sure. Awesome. I'm so glad you could both participate. Yes, it was so great. So um, you know, I just want to thank the APDA again for supporting this and, you know, I think that this is an example of the types of, of wonderful uh, programming that's possible and 
I do think that we will continue to try to provide this virtually moving forward, even post pandemic, because we've been able to reach so many more people this way. And um, it's just been such a gratifying experience um, for me as well as for the grad students as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Great program. All right, so now would be, I thought, a good time to meet some of the players behind the scenes and get a feel for what the mass chapter looks like and the players involved. Um, and happy to announce that this year the chapter um, has grown so much and developed a need for an executive director. Um, please, if you haven't met Bill Patjane, reach out to him. He is open. He is happy to meet people. Uh, he unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, joined the group just as everything shut down with COVID. So Bill has yet to meet a lot of people in person, um, which has helped him become a, an expert at these virtual things. Um, and it also happens to be Bill's birthday today. So happy birthday, Bill. Thank you for sharing it with the APTA. And then many of you know, um, the backbone and support to uh, the office is Rosemary, uh, savior of all and doer of everything. Um, I'm sure you have all at some point um, run into Rosemary. Um, she is just awesome and such a valuable asset to the team. So thank you, Rosemary. Uh, and then, um, we are so fortunate here in Massachusetts to be home to so many great um, service providers, if you will. Um, I think we have one of, if not the best information and referral centers um, in the country and uh, led by the one and only Kathy Thomas. Uh, if you don't know Kathy, then I don't know where you have been. Um, she is really the face, I think, of the Parkinson's community here in Massachusetts, championing, championing all of the efforts and, and really being the voice of what the community needs. And then in support and working in the same office as Kathy is Rosemary Owen. Uh, we also are home to two, in the small state of Massachusetts, two advanced centers for research. Um, Marie St. Hilaire at Boston Medical and Clemens Scherzer at Brigham and Women's. Uh, so they are doing all kinds of wonderful research for us and feeding back up to national and participating in all of the wonderful grants um, and research programs that hopefully one day we'll find a cure for Parkinson's. And then additionally, on top of all of that, if that was not enough, we are also home to the APDA's National Resource Center for Rehabilitation located at Bar uh, excuse me, Boston University Sargent College and headed by Terry Ellis, who is just a little bundle of energy in my book. And the, um, right behind her is Tammy DeAngelis. So we have some great people running these uh, services and programs in support of everybody, um, not only here in Massachusetts, but through, throughout the country. So we are very fortunate for that. All right, um, next I would like to introduce you to the Mass Chapter Board, and this will serve as our official roll call for this meeting. The, the board is comprised of all volunteers, which in and of itself is uh, amazing, the amount of time and commitment that these individuals give, um, day in and day out, really. And as uh, Melissa uh, noted in, in her um, acceptance of the award, you get involved and you don't leave. <laughs> I mean, many of us have been here um, upwards of 20, 20 years. Um, and even if you think about leaving, it's not gonna happen. You're, you're, you're pulled back in somehow by something awesome and then you're never sorry that you stayed. Uh, my name is Kristen Stapleton. I've been serving as chapter president for probably about six years now. I'm happy to do so. And my connection with Parkinson's is through my mother who lived uh, for many years with Parkinson's. And our treasurer is Alex Yen, and you'll hear from him in a little bit. Um, and one of the many reasons that Melissa was awarded the uh, Sean Thornton Award is she continues to serve as secretary on the chapter as she has for many, many years. And then um, 
if you can maybe unmute yourself, my members at large um, who aren't having a speaking role, um, and just say hello as I call your name. Uh, Alex Deal joined us in the past few years. Dan, hey, Dan Harvey has been with us for many years. And he is a patient advocate as well, doing a lot of good work for people with Parkinson's. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Joe Finer, uh, also someone living with Parkinson's who is unable to join us today um, because he is participating in one of the programs that the chapter supports, Rocksteady Boxing. And this is the first time he's been able, he said to get together with his fellow Parkies. So he didn't want to miss that. So certainly a good reason to miss this. Meg McCulloch, uh, who's instrumental in a lot of our, our um, raffle prizes um, and soliciting uh, gifts for us in many of our fundraising endeavors. Uh, hey, someone, everybody. Hey, Meg. And many of you may know Saba Shahid uh, from the Art Cart, yet another program that the chapter um, supports. And she has been able to transition to delivering that virtually as well. I'm not hearing from Saba. Okay, Bob Tullis, Bob and Lori Joe Tullis, who come to us from uh, Florida. Now they originally from Cape Cod, but they are fortunate enough to be stuck in Florida. Um. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi, um. how are you? Good. And uh, last but not least, Denise Turpin, uh, who has been with us for, uh, <laughs> Probably more than half of her life. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, instrumental, as many of you know, um, in, in the walks and the walks uh, with Kathy since its inception. So thank you for all your years. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, also, we heard from Lisa Summers. And um, I'm going to pass the torch over to Bill, and he is going to give a shout out to the many advisors uh, that work closely with the chapter to help deliver um, these valuable programs and services. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, board. Uh, very much appreciate all your help and support, as well as uh, Rosemary. And we have a volunteer on the call today on the meeting. Uh, Brittany, thank you for your support. I. You know, as Kristen said, day one was in the office with Kathy. Day two was, uh, you know, in COVID pandemic mode at home working remotely. And, you know, if you had uh, presented that to me before I took the role, I might not have taken it. But one of the important silver linings to the role that I have is that I get to work with an incredible board and an incredible group of advisors. And when I say incredible, that is probably an understatement. Uh, it, as you take a look at these individuals on our list, you know, they um, are the full range of disciplines, you know, within the Parkinson's community. We've got, you know, uh, Tammy and Terry at BU uh, that work in exercise and rehab and research, Donna McLaughlin, who works you know, in social work and is a group facilitator for us, Marie St. Hilaire, who was our medical director at the INR Center with a great deal of experience in movement disorders and in research. Similarly, David Sommer, who is a neurologist in the Worcester area, um, great, fantastic experience. Lisa Sommers, you heard from Lisa and the, the great work that she's done at UMass, shout out to UMass. Uh, Kathy Thomas, and if you don't know who Kathy Thomas, um, she should wear a big S on her chest every day at work because she is um, a super person. Kathy Thomas is the backbone of the organization. Thank you to, to Kathy. And then Linda Tickledegan, who provides us with expertise in occupational therapy. And she is based at Tufts University. Uh, to give you just a little bit of more information about the advisors, they work um, in interacting with our staff and our board on a regular basis. An example of that might be, you know, we have a specific question that we can't answer around hearing or uh, swallowing that we refer to Lisa on, and she's able to help us navigate, you know, with 
you know, through that situation. They're incredibly valuable to us. They have been even more valuable during the pandemic. Uh, the group at BU has done a fantastic job, you know, with presenting during the pandemic on various topics in and around exercise and staying healthy and staying fit. And they've been, Terry and Tammy have, and the rest of the staff at BU have been fantastic. Uh, additionally, uh, we got our advisors together to review our grants, which is an important function of the advisors. And the advisors review grants, they provide direction to the organization and help us decide, you know, which programs we want to support going forward. Uh, during our last meeting, you know, that we had over the course of the summer, uh, what we did was we uh, asked the advisors to provide some perspective related to what they were seeing on their end um, during the pandemic. And we, we shared some fantastic information. Dr. St. Hilaire shared some great studies around uh, the challenge that people have as they get older in dealing with technology. And the information that she shared with the advisors and, and uh, with us helped us to uh, put together programs to help people with technology and get trained on Zoom. Uh, additionally, one of the things that we were seeing is that uh, people were transitioning from live you know, exercise programs to exercising at home. And so what Terry and her staff did at BU was to provide us with some guidance that we're able to share you know, with people around exercising at home. And uh, not only have we been able to share that with participants and with other chapters, but at this point we're you know, sharing it with some of our exercise partners. So the, the, the advisors are critically important to help us navigate, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have within Parkinson's disease, which is really identifying, you know, where the science is for various things that come up. And what we wanna do as an organization as a, and as a chapter is we wanna follow the science. There's, there's many different, you know, technologies and many different modes and gadgets out there these days and exercise programs. And, you know, what the advisors do is help us as an organization navigate through that science and identify what is science-based, you know, therapy to move forward. And so the advisors are incredibly important. Having said that, one of the strategic goals that we've had as, a, as an organization is to try and target the underserved community. And why that's incredibly important is that based on the feedback um, that we've received and the science out there is that generally speaking, the underserved community has um, less access to information and you know, me medicine. And the challenge with that is a lot of times what happens with the underserved community is that they don't get diagnosed until their later stages of Parkinson's disease. And the reason that that's a challenge is that they lose the window of opportunity to change the trajectory or the path, you know, of, of uh, Parkinson's disease. And so, um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that that is an important strategic initiative for not only the national organization, as Leslie spoke about, but also here as a chapter. And so having said that, I'd like to announce that we've added an advisor to our group, somebody that I have, I have some experience working with. His name is Craig Andre. And Craig uh, and I worked together decades ago, and we stayed in contact. And um, currently, Craig is the Associate Dean of Practice and the Director of the Activist Lab and Interim Chair of 
Community Health Science at Boston University School of Public Health. He was previously with the Department of Public Health as a director in Massachusetts. And he leads uh, or has led uh, racial equality leadership team and uh, a collaborative. And so what I'm hoping to do with Craig and the rest of the advisors is to find a way to increase the visibility of our organization within the community so that we can get people the proper you know, care that they need. And the way that we hope to do that is by creating pathways you know, for them to get the services that they need. So I'm very excited to have Craig helping advise us um, moving forward and I'm hoping to have an advisory meeting sometime you know, within the course of this calendar year just to make sure that everybody understands uh, what our plans are for the upcoming year. And so having said that, uh, I'd like to transition to Terry Ellis. And those of you that don't know Terry Ellis, um, Terry has been responsible for helping us um, put together our program grants. And you can see on the screen that we have a substantial amount of program grants that we've supported in the course of the last year, a full range of, of programs all the way from art programs to high level exercise programs, the UMass group and choruses across the state. And so uh, I'd like to introduce Terry Ellis, Dr. Terry Ellis. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, you know, we are privileged to have the support and guidance of the APDA in all of the work that we do. And uh, I'm gonna share just a little bit uh, about what we've been doing this past year, which has been just, as you've already heard, just unprecedented, uh, some of the things that have evolved. Um, so we have done um, our group. First of all, our group is made up of uh, physical therapists primarily, or physical therapists in training, or physical therapists doing post-professional training. So they're in a residency program. Um, and then we have PhD students who are training to be to do research in the area of rehabilitation in people with Parkinson's disease. So one of the things I wanted to highlight is with the support of the APDA, we are training the next generation of rehabilitation professionals. And that is huge because we want people right from their training to understand Parkinson's disease, to be excited to work with this population and they are. And so uh, a lot of the opportunities that I'm gonna share with you in a minute, everybody participates. We have a big team and everybody participates and that's what we want because we want people to, to learn from real people with Parkinson's disease. And that's what makes people you know, really good at it. So we've done a lot of community outreach. Uh, the APDA at the national office, Robin Kornhaber reached out to us right early on when this pandemic hit and said, hey, one of the things we're hearing is that at the national level, uh, people are sedentary, right? People all of a sudden they had to stay at home, not going out and, and adopting more sedentary behaviors. So uh, we jumped right on board and started doing some webinars. It started out with one and then it was weekly and then it continued into the fall and we're still doing more in November and December. And so this has been a great opportunity. Many, many members of our team have been involved in doing these webinars all around all different aspects of how do you exercise successfully at home? How do you stay safe at home? How do you social distance if you're gonna take a walk outside? Is that still okay? You know, how do you get the intensity of exercise that you need? Uh, how do you sort of avoid sitting too much during the day and getting that motivation to get out and do more? So uh, we've done, you know, lots of different webinars and we've made these webinars specifically available through the APDA Mass Chapter newsletter, the links, so that everybody in Massachusetts is well aware. Uh, they could access you know, the webinars via uh, you know, a link, but they access the recording at any time. So even if they couldn't be there in the moment to watch, these things are accessible for a long time, which is great. Uh, we've continued you know, with, with you know, Kathy Thomas's guidance to, uh, to implement the Good Start program. So we've done it virtually. 
and it's just as good, I would say. <laughs> you know, it was very successful. We had all the same experts sharing the information. The participants were very engaged, asking a lot of great questions. We've been uh, we've been asked to speak at lots lots of the press programs this year, which has been great because of a lot of our team members uh, have been able to do this, and and it's been a great learning experience for everybody. I've gotten some nice feedback. I think Sarah was here, gave uh, wrote in and gave me some uh, nice feedback about the there are residents who uh, who went and did one of the recent talks, so that's great to hear. Uh, we did on a moment's notice, uh, within 10 days, we flipped our entire clinical practice to telemedicine. And so we got a whole telemedicine practice up and running. And I have to say, I, I, I didn't know, you know how this was gonna work out. And there's certainly been some issues and challenges with technology and trying to reach people, but we've had an increase uh, by about 30% in our clinical care. Mostly that's attributed to the fact that we can reach people nationwide. And so people or, or people and people in Massachusetts that are too far away from Boston who don't wanna drive in. You know, so we've been able to cross state lines. We've been able to reach people in central and Western Massachusetts, be, you know, because they wanna reach, uh, they want the expertise, but it's too difficult to travel. And with the pandemic, not necessarily recommended. So this has been great. Um, and that has continued. Let's all hope the insurance companies, third party payers stay on board, particularly Medicare and continue to reimburse uh, telemedicine visits because I think this is a huge benefit for our, uh, our population. And then uh, in terms of research, we have multiple research trials going on, but I'll point out two because these are two uh, exercise trials. And what's important here, these are NIH funded. We work closely with Kathy Thomas, Marie St. Hilaire, and now Ludi Shi is involved in, the, in these studies. And in the, on the WIPPD side, we're looking for people who are kind of have more sort of uh, in the middle stages of Parkinson's disease, who want to exercise and who need help exercising. So we have a sort of a behavioral approach to this, how to, how to get motivated and how to keep exercising over the long term, over a whole year. And so we're still able to do that in the course of the pandemic. A lot of our assessments now and a lot of our treatments are done remotely. So we meet with people on Zoom or through a specific app and we're able to still help them. And then we're all getting ready to start up what's called the SPARKS trial. This is a trial for newly diagnosed people uh, who aren't taking medicine yet and who, who we're looking to uh, investigate the benefits of high intensity exercise on potentially mitigating uh, the progression of the disease. So that's very exciting. We're looking forward to that. And we're gonna be you know, offering these opportunities, particularly to people living in Massachusetts and sometimes even beyond. So thank you very much. I, I can't thank the APD enough, uh, APDA enough for their support. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do all of these activities that we love doing. And, and, and like I started off saying, I'm, I'm really excited about training the next generation of people. We've got a lot of our graduates up there, uh, out there doing things, uh, treating people with Parkinson's disease all over the country. And um, one, one last thing I wanna say is that the, the American Physical Therapy Association decided that they wanted to, um, uh, they thought it was time that we put together clinical practice guidelines for physical therapists nationwide to teach people how to, you know, the, the best evidence, as Bill was saying, the best evidence that, that is out there to guide the treatment of people with Parkinson's disease. And I'm privileged to be able to chair that committee. And Tammy DeAngelis is, is also a member. Christina Colin Semenzer is a member. So we're gonna have a big impact on, on publishing guidelines that are gonna be used nationwide. And so again, uh, we need the support of the APDA to, to, really, to really get this information out there. So thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, it's um, Kathy speaking. Um, thank you, Terry, for that great overview and congratulations to Melissa. And thank you, Leslie, for joining us today. And, and as ever, our wonderful um, advisors and volunteers, um, I greatly appreciate it. I'm just gonna take a few moments just to review a little bit um, about the APDA Information and Referral Center. 
Um, this is a program that is, um, has been developed by the National APDA um, and information and referral centers are strategically um, placed around the country, um, oftentimes in academic centers. Um, and it's really a resource for our entire community, whether you are living with Parkinson's, have a family member or a healthcare provider, to be able to um, you know, access information and to know what local referral um, options you might have. I have the great pleasure of working with Dr. Marie St. Hilaire and, and Rosemary Owen, um, and they do an incredible amount of work to um, make this um, happen. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, we won't talk too much more about COVID. Um, Leslie really gave a nice overview of what we've all been feeling, um, certainly. Um, I can tell you every day we learn something new. Um, we have a very busy um, INR center. Um, we receive over 500 contacts per year. And those numbers have not changed. Um, we probably get less phone calls and more emails. Um, that's what's changed over the last few years, um, but it's still um, a high traffic INR center. Um, and I not only rely on um, the folks that staff the INR center, but you know certainly our chapter and our advisors um, to help us with this, um, this demand. Next slide. Okay, I wanted to just mention some of the programs that we have been able to deliver virtually. Um, as Terry mentioned, we've um, delivered two Parkinson Good Start programs, um, one in the Cape area and one in the greater Boston area. But as we know, when a program is virtual, we've been able to have people attend um, from you know, greater distances. We've also just um, delivered um, our second, our, actually our second press program is in progress. They had their A meeting this morning. Um, and I would like to mention Sarah Singer and also Dr. Elizabeth Austin, who is a psychologist um, in Central Mass who have helped us do this. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the press programs in one moment. Um, we had the great opportunity to develop what's called caregiving in quarantine. Um, Sarah Singer, who I believe may have joined us today. Um, I ha had a great opportunity to work with Sarah to develop this um, really unique program, modeled a little bit after the PRESS program. Um, it's delivered in eight week periods. Um, she has just completed her, her second um, caregiver in quarantine um, program. And we have um, developed a monthly program to follow up um, with that. Um, and we've done some other initiatives um, bringing together um, all of our choral program directors to be able to understand how to best deliver choral programs virtually. Next slide. Okay, I just wanted, I want to really mention the APDA press program. This is one of the programs that Leslie mentioned, um, her, her team at the national office working with folks from around the country developed this. Um, we had the pleasure of doing four or five of these in person and had to transition to virtual. And as I mentioned, um, we've just, um, we're halfway through our second virtual program. And what this is, is a program designed for people um, that have uh, been diagnosed less than five years. Oftentimes when people need really good information, um, but also need psychosocial support. Um, so these programs are led by um, social workers or psychologists or OTs, people that have experience in delivering um, group um, psychosocial support to people. Um, we're very excited and looking forward to seeing um, how our evaluations are, but so far so good. Um, and thank you all. Many of you have participated um, in these programs, teaching our newly diagnosed individuals and families. And the next slide. 
So we also have a very large support group network. Um, we have been working since the first week in March um, to bring our support groups um, you know, online um, so that they could meet virtually. Just this week, um, our Mashby support group um, with the assistance of Rosemary was able to go online. So it's been a, um, it's been a slow process. We wanna make sure everything is right. Um, one of our biggest challenges is that although we can offer support to more, more people, we still have many people that cannot um, access the technology required to be um, online. So that is um, part of the Massachusetts chapter strategic plan to be able to do that. Um, and it seems like a year ago, because it was, we had a two day support facilitator training program that was delivered in person. And we will be starting after the new year with some online um, training of support group facilitators. Okay, and next slide. Um, we also provide a lot of support for health professionals. This week I had the pleasure of teaching um, an interdisciplinary team at Quinnipiac University, um, where they have a medical school, a nursing school, PT, OT, every, all in one spot. Um, so we, we find this very, very important. As Terry mentioned, um, training the trainer, whether you're a student or you're already a professional is, is really important um, to make sure we have great programs and care for our population. Okay. And I think um, that may be it. I'm going to transfer to Bill. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Let's give uh, Kathy a virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk about a few of our events that we've delivered in the course of this calendar year. Um, we were able to deliver our 34th annual APDA Optimism Walk and our second annual APDA Parkinson Support Network Cape Cod Optimism Walk, as well as a golf tournament. And to touch upon the Optimism Walk in Massachusetts, uh, it was a very challenging situation uh, when, when we were faced with, you know, the potential of not being able to deliver one of our largest fundraisers of the year for the state. And um, we had, multiple conversations with uh, Kristen, uh, the board, Kathy, Denise, and Kathy and Denise actually uh, started the first walk in Massachusetts. And so, you know, really drawing from their experience, we decided to move forward with delivering the walk virtually. And it's something that the organization um, hadn't had any experience with. I certainly hadn't had any experience with delivering virtual events, uh, some very small ones, but no, nothing, you know, anything like the optimism walk. And so what we decided to do as an organization is get the board involved and volunteers involved. And every Wednesday for about three months, we met until we mapped out, you know, our plan. And each week it was getting everybody together and, you know, uh, trying to move the entire process forward. And um, there were a lot of challenges along the way. Uh, when we first started to map out what the program was going to look like, it was a three hour program. And then we whittled it down to about 50 minutes. Um, and what we, first of all, what we uh, were able to get to, uh, we were able to get to a substantial amount of income from the event. And that's important uh, because as you know, uh, the more that we uh, bring in, the more we're able to provide to the community for our programs and services. Additionally, what we realized is that there was a high level of participation and community engagement uh, related to the event. The feedback that we got from the event was incredibly positive. And what we saw in both you know, uh, the May walk and the September walk on the Cape is that people were really enthusiastic about not only getting involved, but also, you know, engaging with the community. And during this pandemic, 
um, what we realized is that this community involvement is incredibly important to the Parkinson's community. And uh, we were very successful at reaching a lot of people. Uh, we actually, uh, for the first walk, we had a couple of hundred people. We, we estimated around 300, you know, on that first walk. And within a short period of time, what we're seeing is that the event was viewed by thousands of people. And, you know, Kerry uh, Bogle and the Bogle family spoke earlier. They were ab able to engage their family from out of state, which is something that they hadn't done in the past. And so... Uh, we benefited a lot through the process. And from my perspective, one of the most important parts of that whole you know, event was that we were able to, Kristen was able to bring the board together and we were able to move forward with a, a very difficult plan and difficult circumstances and were successful at delivering those events. So thank you to the entire board and all the volunteers and all of the people that participated in that event. We additionally did a Dopa golf tournament, the Tullis family, you can see them in the photograph, they host it in, in Plymouth. And when we first started to have discussions on whether or not they wanted to go forward with the tournament, they were you know, um, going back and forth on deciding uh, whether or not they wanted to do it. Um, we put together a, a great plan, um, mostly, um, mapped out by the family. Uh, th there are a couple of principals within the family that were very involved in the, in the process. Um, and, and they did a fantastic job. It was a great day. Everybody socially distanced. Uh, we were able to you know, really uh, deliver a great event without really causing anybody any harm. And it was fantastic. And we wanna thank the Tullis family for one of our largest fundraisers of the year. So next slide. I wanted to give everybody an overview on our optimism walk trend over the course of the last 10 years. Um, you know, we, we've seen an increase in our optimism walk the last two years, 19 and 20, there's been a bump up and, and that's partly because we've been able to deliver two walks in the state of Massachusetts. It's our plan to continue to do that moving forward. Uh, it's critical to not only, you know, bring in, bringing in income, but it's also important for us to increase our awareness on uh, Cape Cod and uh, Southeast Mass. So uh, next slide, please. You know, again, Optimism Walk was very high, very um, engaging. We saw a great deal of participation. Um, we we're able to send out all the incentives as you know, um, participants typically get the incentives at the event. We we're able to send those in the mail. Um, and it was a fantastic event and the feedback has been fantastic. Thank you, next slide. So I wanna just talk a little bit about our programs and services. And this is um, extracted from the Massachusetts strategic plan. Um, what we want to do is explore the possibility of increasing the number of programs delivered to underserved populations. And, you know, as we move forward, you know, we're going to look to the board and the advisors to help us navigate through that. Uh, I spoke a little bit about that earlier, underserved communities, very important for us to be able to provide them with services and information in order to get them, you know, to the point where they're able to get diagnosed and get the service as they need. Uh, continue to evaluate and revamp our statewide support group network, leadership training, location, et cetera. That's obviously something that Kathy Thomas is very involved with, as well as the next point, continue to offer Parkinson's Good Star program and PRESS program. Fantastic two programs. We've gotten a great amount of uh, participation in, in both those two programs, and they're incredibly important to providing information to the people that need it. Uh, next is improve and maintain community grant program. We supply grants to the community, uh, not only um, for programs, but also individual great grant, you know, uh, support for those individuals that need help with, you know, um, paying for medications or, or respite care. The next point, develop a research update program with Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston University, and the 
Natural Rehab Center to capitalize on our, on our local resources. Something that Terry and her staff and I and, and Kathy have had discussions about is making sure that we're continually being engaged with each other to make sure that we're leveraging each uh, sphere of influence and each channel that we have available. Six, maintain avenues to communicate with local research, uh, researchers that funding grants from APDA National are available. And being in the um, research hub of the world, that's incredibly important. From a fundraising development and awareness standpoint, you know, what we want to do is increase the fundraising revenues, which will support increased funding of research grants at the national level. Uh, additionally, we want to um, execute awareness initiatives and educate the public about Parkinson's disease as a major health issue and promote APDA as a leading authority on subject matter and subject matter expert. And so just make sure that people have the information that they need and uh, providing them with resources, you know, as they move forward. Uh, additionally, extend, expand existing fundraising campaigns and identify new income streams resulting in a diverse sustainable revenue mix that supports our mission. And of course, execute the two optimism walks, both in Massachusetts and Cape Cod. And so um, in saying that, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, another uh, very important member of our organization here in Massachusetts. Um, I'd like to introduce Jay Zavala, who is on the board of the APDA PSN of Cape Cod uh, chapter. Uh, Jay has been with us for quite a while, and uh, he and I stay in contact. He's able to provide me with information uh, from Cape Cod and, and help me keep a pulse on what's happening on the Cape. And so I'd like to introduce Jay Zavala. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate uh, the invitation. You know, uh, I didn't know how I, how I was going to spend this day until Bill locked me in place for this, uh, this uh, conference. It's really great to hear all the, the good things that are happening in our, in our state. Not only was it interesting listening to our leadership, but I was really drawn to what uh, Dr. Summers was saying and, and also Dr. Ellis. Uh, I, I know voice and communications is very important. And in fact, one of the reasons why I accepted your invitation, Bill, is that I know I have to exercise my voice and this is a great way to do that. So uh, hi to everyone. Uh, welcome to Cape Cod. Uh, in my early conversations with Bill, he asked me to express my uh, experiences with PD. What are some of the important aspects of it to me? And also to speak about some of the programs that we've put into effect here on Cape Cod. Uh, our leadership mentioned that there are some 17,000 people with PD in the state and we've been successful in serving uh, seven to 10,000 of those. I believe the estimate is somewhere in the 2000 range for uh, its suspected number of PD patients on Cape Cod. And we serve a, a good number of them. Well, to speak about my own experience, um, when I was diagnosed with PD, I was in the early stages of recovery from a heart attack. And so I was a little bit despondent. But the day that I was diagnosed with PD was a bright sunshiny day and I felt wonderful. I felt like it was a blessing, I was lucky because the first diagnosis that had been made was that I suffered from ALS. So you can imagine how pleased I and my wife were when I found out it was only Parkinson's and then I had to find out all about it. Well, as I was recovering and doing physical therapy for the heart attack, I heard that Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital here on Cape Cod was starting up a program of exercise. So I wanted to incorporate that into my, into my uh, workout regimen. And then I learned about APDA and PSN. There was going to be an educational session 
uh, in, in a few weeks. So I attended that session because this was part of my education. I was being proactive about Parkinson's, something new in my life. Well, I had been the president of the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. And fortunately, uh, Joyce Genovese, the founder of the PSN, uh, lives nearby, recognized me, invited me to sit on the board. And I thought, well, we'll see what happens with this education session. Well, I accepted an invitation to be interviewed. And what resulted from that was that I was invited onto the board and I've been engaged with PSN and the APDA ever since. And it's been a welcomed addition in my life. Um, while going through cardio rehab and, and taking on the activities at Spalding, we learned about Rocksteady Boxing. And Spalding sent a couple of their uh, uh, trainers, P, uh, PT trainers, to Indianapolis to learn what that regimen was all about. And now I've been an active member of the Rocksteady Boxing Group uh, since 2017. Uh, what's really important to me in, in my own, beyond my own education is that of my fellow parkies that I have either not learned about uh, the support network or have not learned about APDA or, or who have not, who are so depressed with having PD, that they're reluctant to take the, edu the easy education that's available to us all. And I'm finding that, in fact, the education, as summarized by Dr. Summers and Dr. Ellis, there's interesting things evolving that, are, that give us reason to hope uh, and to expect better results in, in the future. I know that, I, I think that education in the realms of, of uh, Let me start that again. The education that we get in terms of medications, I think that's very important. I know that being a patient of Dr. St. Hilaire, I'm not only prescribed certain medications, I'm also educated in their cause and effect and what I can expect and anticipate and tweak. And, and, and I've developed my own uh, symptom chart that I use to discuss my movement and where I am at that particular moment when Dr. St. Hilaire and I are having our discussions. Uh, there's all this motivation to become knowledgeable about the disease and our role. The other thing that's very important to me is the way that we embrace our caregivers. I know I'm fortunate to have a retired registered nurse as my spouse and caregiver. And I think our caregivers, uh, we, we could give more attention to them as well. I'm drawn to what our national president is saying about reaching out for the un, under, underserved. Uh, I think that's very important the black and the Hispanic communities. Uh, I, I'd like to see more of that. And of course, I'm elated that Bill has come on board uh, not only has he reached out to me, but he's been an excellent resource for, for me personally, a sounding board. I know one recently, this, uh, I was talking with Bill and I was feeling a bit down because I wasn't doing more. I wasn't more active and, and Bill brought me along very nice. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. Uh, well, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, next speaker, and that would be Associate Professor of Accounting at Stonehill College, board member and APDA MA Treasurer, Alex Yen. Alex? Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, good seeing you again, and good seeing everybody on this uh, Zoom call here. Um, my role is kind of a dual role this year. I, I serve as treasurer, as, as uh, Bill introduced earlier. I'm also the uh, uh, on the nominating committee uh, that puts together the slate of officers for a slate of officers and uh, members at large 
uh, to be elected or reelected to the board uh, for the upcoming uh, for the upcoming uh, term. Uh, as it as it is, we typically have three year terms, and so the group that's being elected this year in 2020 will be elected for three year terms to expire in 2023. Um, You've met all the other board members earlier um, and all four people who are slated uh, to have expiring terms this year have all expressed an interest in continuing. Uh, in addition, we have three new members or three people, prospective new members at large who have expressed an interest in, in joining the board. Uh, Gail Asian, a uh, member at large, uh, has been a volunteer, was involved uh, extensively in this year's walk. Uh, her, hus her husband is, is a person with Parkinson's and she has expressed an interest in joining the board. She's also on today's call. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Bissonette uh, has also been volunteering with us uh, for a number of years. Uh, she is at a uh, uh, movement disorder specialist at Boston University um, Medical Center, and she is interested in being a member at large as well. And Dr. Terrell Johnson, uh, who is a primary care physician at Boston University, has also expressed an interest in becoming a, a member at large. So. Um, the nominating committee has put together this slate of the three new members, as well as the four uh, continuing board members who were, re who were elected initially in 2017 and have expressed an interest to continue. And, you know, they say that once you get on, it, 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 you, know, you stay on for a long time. And I think that's, that's going to be the case uh, for these people right here. So um, this is the slate that the board has, the nominating, nominating committee has put together. Um, I want to turn it over to uh, Kristen Stapleton, the president who has, um, we've already gone through the process of, of, uh, of voting among the, the board members and she will reveal uh, the results of the election. Thank you, Alex. Uh, yeah, in an effort to save, save time, the board was able to um, get some bios on the uh, uh, prospective new board members. And also I had an opportunity to check in with the existing board members with retiring terms. Um, and it is also our commitment as a board to continue to expand, uh, not only in um, profession or ability or um, background, but also to tap into diversity and make sure that the board is also representative of the community that, that we serve. Um, so with that, I am happy to report that it was unanimous to accept uh, everybody slated, Gail Asian, Dr. Bissonette, Dr. Johnson, as well as returning members, uh, Meg McAuliffe, uh, Melissa Diggin, Alex Yen, and Bob Tallis. So uh, welcome new members and thank you returning members. Uh, we look forward to many years, many, many years um, working with you. Um, also anybody on the call, if you are interested in becoming more active in the chapter, I welcome you to reach out to, to anybody on the chapter really, but myself or, or Bill for a discussion on how you might get involved. Um, and as I said, we're always looking for different perspectives and different people to give us their opinions and help make sure that we truly are serving the needs of the Parkinson's community. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Bill to jump in now and we'll talk a little bit about um, moving forward um, and some things that we are hoping to uh, work on um, from a community perspective, really. Uh, Bill talked about awareness. Uh, one of the many things that we've done in past years is uh, Parkinson's Awareness Night at Fenway Park. We are talking to the Red Sox. Um, whether or not or how that might work, uh, we still don't know. Uh, and then there's also, if you can do the next slide, um, a, a, an event that's held uh, at Sally O'Brien's um, every year. And uh, they're, they're doing it again this year virtually. So uh, I think Rosemary can attest, but it should be on our website, a link on how you might get involved yes. uh, with that fundraiser. Um, Bill, any words about sure. what's in your mind? Sure, absolutely. So that event is actually going to be filmed um, within the course of the next couple of weeks. And so as soon as we you know, get that link, um, we'll get it up and uh, people will be able to participate. Uh, the backstory of that is that uh, the, the man in the photograph, um, Sean Danahy, uh, lived uh, with a dad who had Parkinson's disease and one of his mentors, who is currently in a nursing home, who is a 
you know, very famous mus local musician um, also was dealing with Parkinson's disease. And so he reached out to us um, to, to let us know that he wanted to continue moving forward without a vet. And so what we decided to do is they're going to um, record it at the bar and then we're going to be able to deliver it virtually. And so we'll be able uh, to, you know, have a celebration during that and continue, you know, the very important um, event that we had going on for a long time. And that's what we hope to do in the course of, you know, the next six months as an organization is we want to try and find and um, keep those important things moving forward, find new ones, as well as keep the uh, things that have been going on for a long time moving forward. And uh, what we're looking to do is, you know, continue making sure that we're engaging with the community. One of the important benefits to being, you know, um, uh, in, in this pandemic is that we've been able to engage with people at a much higher level and much more frequently. And so what we're hoping to do is um, allow people that are you know, engage with APDA um, to continue to, you know, build awareness within their spheres of influence. And, you know, that's incredibly important to us as an organization. And what we hope to try and do is uh, build, um, you know, build as much, you know, uh, enthusiasm as it relates to the work that we're doing as we can. And our plan is this, this event is being recorded. Uh, we're gonna put it on YouTube and then we're, we're gonna move forward with trying to uh, make sure that people get this message. And so having said that, um, I'd like to open it up for any comments or questions to the group. So um, if you'd like, unmute yourself. And if you have any questions you know, for the entire board before we stop, um, uh, just let us know. So open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Bill, um, uh, uh, the, the event that, that's in Somerville, uh, it does make, have the APA name on there, but, but uh, wondering if we can maybe uh, Put the logo on that there, and and maybe have uh, okay. a, a banner or something at the event, so that uh, people will be aware of who who they what this is, who this supports, and so forth. Absolutely, thank you, Dan. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we've actually had a couple of discussions with uh, the the band leader uh, who is coordinating it. It's going to be three bands, and he's going to be making sure that he's. Um, talking about the message of APDA and uh, Parkinson's disease during the event. And so thank you, Dan. The, the, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, uh, um, I'm quite involved with my high school reunion. And um, uh, one of my classmates, when he heard that I had Parkinson's, he came over to me and uh, he, he has a band that plays, has played at our reunions. And he said to me, if, we needed a band for an event or anything to um, let him know and that he would uh, be able to uh, bring his small band to uh, perhaps do a, an event. Uh, they just uh, they've been recently been playing um, uh, at, at a, uh, a bar that's in uh, uh, near Hanscom Field um, in, in Lexington um, and uh, so he, he, he said, anytime you need a band for an event, just let me know. Um, so that's another possibility. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that you, I really appreciate your introducing me to the, the head of the uh, APDA uh, Center at Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, he couldn't have been more excited to, to take me on a tour of his uh, uh, facility at the, at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, center and uh, he took me uh, uh, through the labs and had fellows, fellows and uh, students uh, who were working on various experiments and so forth. 
uh, show me a, a lot of what they're doing. And, and he's very proud of the, the, the program and and uh, and what they're trying to achieve. And uh, and I talked with him about um, looking at uh, having like uh, client councils. Um, I've been involved with that in the past where they have people with Parkinson's sort of advise them uh, how um, when a trial is being set up or a study is being set up to make it easy for uh, the participants uh, to participate. Um, and uh, I sort of explained what I'd done, been involved with in the past. And he, he was uh, looking at uh, doing that when they're doing some of their trials that, that are gonna be coming up. Uh, and uh, he was just wonderful to, to deal with. And, and uh, it, it was a pleasure meeting all his staff. I get to see, look at some things that are microscopes and it was just a very, very nice um, day that I spent uh, yesterday um, at, at uh, the, the hospital. That's great. I talked to Dr. Scherzer. He said he had a VIP day uh, lined up for you and I really appreciate it. It's too bad I was actually going to think about joining you, but there were some restrictions involved with that. That's great. Thank you very much for the update. Um, that's great. Does anybody else in the community have any questions or comments? While you're thinking about that, I would just like to say it's, it's evident and obvious by everybody speaking um, what support and enthusiasm there is throughout the Parkinson's community to stay together, stay committed, deliver quality programs, to become involved. Um, and we're so proud of the work that we do here in Massachusetts. And, you know, the event at Sally O'Brien's, which is going virtually, I mean, this is another way that you can bring things into your community and bring help bring awareness. It doesn't have to be a huge event or a huge gala. It can be something small within your net, network of people um, to raise awareness. Um, it doesn't matter how much you raise, every penny counts. And we're here as an organization to support you um, either in coming up with ideas or in helping you implement um, a fundraiser, no matter how big or small. So keep that in mind if you have something. Dan, I'm here and I don't know, maybe your friend wants to do Battle of the Bands. All right, so anybody have um, any more thoughts, comments, questions? It's been wonderful for um, to see all of your faces. And um, I'm really pleased with the number of people that got on the call that, that shows that we are making a difference. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hi, my name is Patricia Kamish Young. Uh, Dr. St. Hilaire is my neurologist. I'm from the Cape. Hi, Dr. St. Hilaire. Um, I just wanted to say that I just completed the LSBT uh, big program at Spalding in Hyannis. It was a four week program and four days a week, one hour a day. And it was great. I am so happy that you gave me that um, information about it. And uh, I will continue with that forever. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. You're welcome. Good. Does anybody have any additional questions? Let me just double check the chat and make sure there was no questions in there. I know Rosemary is yeah. watching. No, just a lot of positive comments. Yay. Yeah. I just want to say that um, I couldn't be part of a, a you know, more important and significant and great organization than the APDA of Massachusetts. Um, every time I interact with uh, staff, board, and advisors, I think to myself how lucky I am to be able to work with such a great organization. I think the future is certainly going to be challenging for us, but with the individuals that we have on board, um, uh, on the board, as well as the advisors, uh, the future certainly is continues to be bright for the APDA of Massachusetts. I'm very excited about our group of advisors with the addition of, of Craig. I'm also very excited about the addition of our uh, three new board members that will um, help us move the organization forward. So uh, Gail Asian has been um, uh, extremely helpful to the organization in many ways. Uh, she's been fantastic with the walk. Um, Gail, if you have um, the ability to 
kind of pop on and just say hello to the group, that would be great. How, how come I knew you were going to call me out and make me say something? Because you <laughs> That's know what me. you do. <laughs> At the end of every meeting, well, Gail, uh, but I, I guess I do. I think I was a shy one in high school. In school, I never said anything. I guess I need the teachers to like point at me and make me say something. But this was, I have to, I hate to admit, I'm on the board now and this is my first annual meeting I've ever listened to or been to. So I feel like I might have neglected something because I found out a lot of good information. Um, and some classes I want to sign Mike up for and all that. But um, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to step up and help a little more than we have because I could, before I sit back and do a little here and there and get more involved. And, um, and even Bill, Bill joining the group here because I love everyone that's already here and have for the last 13 years or so we've been around. But uh, it's funny that how Bill came in just in March and, and several times Mike has said, don't you feel like we've known Bill for a long time? And like, he's just a good fit for all of us and, uh, and making me talk when I really don't think I have anything to say. So I'm excited to get moving forward. Good seeing everyone's face. And just to give Gail some props, I have to say that Gail was fantastic with the walk. Whenever she was one of the largest fundraising teams, if not the largest, and, uh, she was involved in the walk committee as a volunteer. She also helped with our corporate sponsorships. Uh, she helped me strong arm some of the pharma companies to help support us from a corporate standpoint. She also helped modify the video that we use during the event. And so I'm really excited about having um, Gail Asian on the board. And hopefully we'll be able to get the washers tournament up and running sometime down the line. She's done a local fundraiser. And so, have you on board, Gail. Yeah, and then next is Stephanie Bissonette. Is Stephanie still there? I'd love to, you know, hear a little bit from you, Stephanie, if you have the opportunity, if you're still there. I am still here. Um, thank you, Bill. And thank you to everyone for the vote and um, including me and thinking of me for the, the board. The APDA is such a big part of what I do and, and provides such wonderful support for all of my patients. Um, I learned through Gail that I'm terrible at washers. So I don't know if I'm as looking, I'm looking forward to the event as much as everyone else. Um, but the walk is, is really a highlight of my year, um, both the Cape Cod and the Boston one. So I'm really looking forward to having a bigger, a bigger role in the organization. So thank you. Thank you. And the, and the last is uh, Terrell Johnson is unable to meet with us today, but is very excited about participating in the board just to give you a little bit of background, one of his first patients was a uh, individual that had uh, Parkinson's disease that was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He's not a neurologist or movement disorder doc, but um, from my perspective, he's gonna help us create pathways to educate the community as it relates to getting information about uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, going through the path of diagnosis. And so he's a community doc and we're looking very much forward to helping him. He's very interested in helping us with uh, targeting the underserved community as well as um, diversity. Good. Does anybody have anything, any other questions or any other comments? And I'd just like to invite everybody to join us um, on Facebook if you're not already, um, as well as follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Stay connected to us every way you can. Um, check in with the uh, APDAMA.org website for everything you want to know that we're up to. Yeah. And help get everybody that you know involved with the APDA. We can certainly use help in many different ways, birthday fundraisers, volunteering to help people, you know, fill out disability forms, you know, a wide range of things. And as we move forward, um, you know, during this pandemic time, uh, we're gonna be bringing online some new virtual programming and we're looking very much forward to that. And thank you all for joining us and for your time. Um, and 
if no one has anything else, we will wish you a fabulous afternoon and look forward to seeing you probably virtually for a while. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.